Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to the podcast. I hope you're all doing great. In this episode, returning for our third time is Dr. Amy Brady. In case you missed those episodes, Amy is the editor-in-chief of the Chicago Review of Books and deputy publisher of Guernica Magazine. And she is my climate fiction, or as some call it, cli-fi, guru and mentor. It's been a while since we last chatted, and Amy comes on to update on some of the latest climate fiction work, how the genre is evolving, and how it's becoming more relevant in popular culture, even outside of books. It's always a treat chatting with Amy and glad to have her back on. We have started a bi-weekly newsletter here at America Daps. We highlight the latest episode and also link to news and stories that are related to that episode's topic. We also highlight other climate podcasts and share a few other adaptation-related goodies. In the show notes, there is a link to subscribe. Please do. Okay, adapters, let's join in with Dr. Amy Brady and catch up on the latest with climate fiction. Hey, Adapters. Today, I have a very exciting episode. My guest, who's a familiar name to you, is Dr. Amy Brady. Amy is the editor-in-chief of the Chicago Review of Books and deputy publisher of Guernica Magazine. Amy also writes and publishes the monthly climate change newsletter, Burning World, Climate Change in Art and Literature. Hey, Amy. Welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Doug. Thanks for having me back. Always a treat to have you on. I think this is your third appearance. They're always very popular, and thank you so much for coming on. So we're going to talk cli-fi, climate fiction, but let's just check in. What's going on with you? Oh, man. You know, uh, the craziness of the world aside, I, in my little area of the world, things are going well, healthy, happy, <laughs> <laughs> close to family, so things are good. Perhaps my most exciting news is that I have a book coming out in early 2022 called House on Fire. It's an edited anthology of personal essays about climate change that feature some of my favorite writers who are working right now. It's co-edited by the brilliant editor, Taja Eason, and I can't wait to share it with the world. I will obviously have you back when that comes out to to do a nice plug for it when looking forward to that. Okay, so you do a popular, and and I want to talk about the newsletter a bit more about the content later on, but let's just check in for people that aren't familiar. So you do a climate change newsletter, Burning Worlds. What's that about? Yeah. So the newsletter is an extension of the original column that uh, I still write for the Chicago Review of Books. That column is also called Burning Worlds. And every month I interview a fiction writer who has written a novel or a collection of short stories, sometimes even a poet who is addressing climate change in their work. That uh, became a very popular column. And people started asking me, well, what about other types of writers or excuse me, of artists and creatives? And so I I created the newsletter, Burning Worlds, to explore how artists of all kinds are addressing climate change and thinking about it. Well, I recommend to my listeners, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the newsletter. It's fantastic. And I want to ask about some of the content of that a little bit, but let's I'm still doing this catch up with you. And so you and I did our first episode. It's actually been a while. I was looking back on it. And you were actually, I think, in my first year. So we, we, we go way back. Yeah. It's, and I've been doing this for like four years now. So it's been, it's been a little while. But I guess what I want to ask is that as you've gotten more into this climate fiction space, it's probably been quite a journey for, I mean, sort of this podcast has been a journey for me, but you can't necessarily predict some of the things that you get involved in and get invited in. So I guess, for example, you know, you recently moderated a, a panel with NRDC. I mean, these are some probably some partnerships you didn't necessarily anticipate you'd be having. Yeah, I had no idea. It turns out that people in the climate space are really kind, collaborative people who are always seeking to do things together. And so I've had the great opportunity and the great pleasure of partnering with people like the NRDC, you know, as you know, as well as other uh, you know, writers, artists and organizations, other universities and colleges and schools who are really interested in bringing conversations about climate change, you know, to the greater public. And so I've so enjoyed being a part of these conversations because it's it's really it's just a really meaningful thing. All right. So what was the uh, the panel with NRDC? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the NRDC Guernica Magazine, where uh, I serve as deputy publisher, and the Brooklyn Book Festival got together to put on a panel about narrative and storytelling surrounding climate change. And so that panel featured Rob Moore, who you just mentioned, who's a policy expert at the NRDC, who uses storytelling to get across to public officials and other folks in leadership about why climate change, why doing something about climate change is so important. I mean, as he put it, people respond to storytelling uh, much more than they respond to a cold graph or um, a list of statistics. But that panel was great because it also featured the novelist, Chaya Sidbenthan, artist, uh, as well as a journalist from The New Yorker who writes, you know, nonfiction, investigative journalism about climate change. So just all types of storytelling and storytellers coming together to talk craft. It was it was a lot of fun. Cool. All right. This is a very open ended question, but let's just start it. And so CliFi isn't going anywhere. In fact, it's only going to become more popular. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? I know you and I had this conversation three years ago, but like what what's sort of happening in this space? What are you noticing? Well, climate change fiction, climate fiction, um, some people call it cli-fi, you know, it's just becoming more and more popular among writers and also among readers. I'd like to think or the books wouldn't be published in the first place. But what's so interesting is that I'm noticing a lot more works of climate fiction being published by international voices in translation. And that is so exciting to me because here in the relatively climate stable United States, I think it's still really difficult for a lot of people to imagine what climate change is going to do to their communities and to the people and places that they love. Whereas in other places in the world where that, you know, people are already witnessing some of the worst effects of climate change firsthand. And even in other places where maybe they're not witnessing the worst effects, like, say, you know, Germany or northern Europe, they at least exist in a political landscape where they can have more robust conversations about climate change. And so all of that is informing these writers work. And so when it comes to the United States, it just provides for or just makes for a much richer range of stories that, you know, I haven't really seen yet in the, gosh, almost four years that I've been doing this or been covering this. And you, you follow folks on Twitter, you know, probably some similar folks that I follow. And you see a lot of, uh, I guess, announcements for climate books and a lot of it lends itself to the, the nonfiction category. And I wonder, and it, it seems like there might be some diminishing returns for a lot of those books. <laughs> I'll probably get my hands <laughs> slapped for this. And, you know, I, I find like probably some of the more popular ones are more or less books about cheerleading, keeping people's spirits up that if you're in this fight, and that's a good thing, I, I appreciate that, but it just seems that it's basically a lot of the same kind of material over and over again, hoping to, will this kind of make the difference or will this kind of create some new buzz around doing something around climate change? And I guess my point here is that hopefully climate fiction maybe will step in there and, and I guess, drive more interest in action. If that you could be completely disagree with that sort of assessment of like with all the books coming out in the nonfiction space. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think you have a point that there could be an oversaturation point. I don't know that we've reached that yet. I, I think in the wide range of publishing, books about climate change still take up a relatively small amount of real estate. And the fact that we are seeing so many more works of nonfiction and fiction about climate change come out, I think at this point anyway, can only be a good thing because it means that more people are going to take notice of it. You know, we live right now, I mean, I'm talking to you from New York City, you know, so you know, here in the United States, we are at a very crucial pivot point in our politics and in our history. And so much is demanding our attention. You know, the fact that climate change is getting mentioned at all during any of the, the debates is astounding because it, it historically hasn't been. But since so much is trying to take our attention, I think that the more you know, stories we have about climate change is is good. It's going to remind people that, yes, all of these other things matter, but the fact that we have to worry about having a stable biosphere, like that is kind of the ultimate worry, <laughs> that the biosphere is the thing from which we derive all value of life as we know it. So let's not take our eyes you know, off the goal here. 
All right. And I'm total agreement. And I hope my, you know, it wasn't so much a dismissal of the content of the book. It's more of like, I guess what the orbits keep getting smaller and smaller. And, and I just, I, yeah. I, I'm hoping that, you know, with climate fiction, it's an opportunity to blaze new ground on the type of readers that might be interested in the subject. So that that's my hope. Yeah. Again, with trends, this, when I, when I read your newsletter and I see the authors and the books that you're talking about and Quite honestly, you know, this this seems like literature. These are people writing really smart, intelligent books. But do you get to follow maybe other areas of fiction with you know climate fiction? And what I'm talking about is like even things like pulp fiction and graphic novels and those areas. Do you follow those things? And is climate change showing up in these uh, you know more I guess popular types of reading material? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that climate change or at least environmentalism, though, I think. I think climate change is also a part of this, you know, has long been depicted in comic books. You know, for example, it's also increasingly popular in um, movies and TV shows as themes. Yeah, I mean, it it is kind of everywhere. I mean, you're right. I do focus uh, more on the quote unquote literary aspect of climate fiction storytelling, mostly just because that's my background. Um, You know, I have a Ph.D. in literature, but (laughs) uh, but yeah, it's it's everywhere. I mean, what something that I have had to think about as somebody who follows, you know, fictional stories about climate change is, you know, at what point can I even call climate fiction a genre anymore? And I say that not because it's going away, but exactly the opposite. When graphic, you know, novelists, when, you know, so-called literary writers, poets, screenwriters, television showrunners, when everybody is writing about climate change, the notion of genre kind of dissolves a little bit. And at some point, I think we just have to think, well, these are creative people simply responding to the moment in which we live, you know, kind of like in the early 20th century when writers and artists were responding to the rise of modernism. I mean, that, you know, modernism or modernity isn't a genre. It's a condition. It's a human condition. And so I think we are going to continue to see climate change addressed in all of these different mediums and different genres. But I think time will tell whether we can actually consider it to be its own, its own genre. Right now, it still kind of feels like that. But yeah, like I say, it's for the for future generations to decide, I think. I wonder if like we know we've really sort of made progress getting it out into the public's mind. It's like climate change is showing regularly up in like Harlequin novels and those kind of books, you know, It's, it's like that would mean general public is you know, understanding these things. So if you're out there writing Harlequin models, please consider a climate change themed one. That would that would make some <laughs> progress. So sticking to that, but you, you, I mean, I know you focus on books, and but you, even your newsletter, it's you're talking about art and literature, so art can take many forms. And have you heard much? You know, you deal with a lot of authors and such, but it's sort of that next level of popularity is well, this is going to get made into a TV show or, or a movie. Are you hearing? Is that happening more or like those kind of people looking at these climate fiction books and, and is that's an, I guess, an opportunity for them more, more so now than even just a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I don't want to be the person to break news, <laughs> but okay. you know, I, I have talked to a couple of fairly prominent writers who I will leave unnamed at the moment, who I know have uh, TV deals in the works and based on their novels, which were about climate change. So I think the next couple of years, we are going to see some incredible new series based on some really powerful works of climate fiction. There's that, but I, you know, to kind of get to your, to your other question of, you know, kind of, or, or maybe just the idea of, you know, who is kind of driving this. So the NRDC, I know, has recently put together a, I'll just call it a task force. I don't know what they call it internally. You know, people who are actually meeting with screenwriters and showrunners and producers in Hollywood to talk about um, how to get more climate stories on the big screen. And a part of that is introducing them to the the climate fiction writers. A part of that is working with screenwriters to develop new stories. Also, a part of that is introducing fiction writers to scientists to get them to talk about, you know, what are some of the things that we're seeing happening as a result of climate change that would make for good storytelling. And I think it was just last December 
we saw a collaboration between the McSweeney's Press and the NRDC called 2040 AD. And it was an anthology of short stories by writers, many of them who have never explored climate change in their fiction before, writing about just that. And the collaboration was between them and scientists. Each writer was partnered with a scientist about a specific aspect of climate change, you know, whether it was sea level rise or wildfire. And what was so remarkable about that anthology was that because so many of those writers hadn't written about climate change before, perhaps they hadn't even thought about it too much before, they were suddenly creating stories that didn't rely on a lot of the same tropes that I've been seeing over and over again in climate fiction. It felt fresh, it mm. felt new, and it just really drove home, you know, how enormous climate change is and how it touches on so many different aspects of our lives. Very cool. You do focus more on the literary side of climate fiction and what's going on on campuses, university campuses. English lit is still a very popular major. Are you getting asked? Are you hearing more about professors bringing climate fiction into those areas to, to I guess, to talk with their students and use it as a resource? Yeah, a lot of professors are teaching courses dedicated to climate fiction. So it's a really exciting time. Academia historically, and I can say this because I've been in academia for so long, it tends to lag behind the real world in a lot of ways, at least English departments do. They don't always keep up on publishing trends. So the fact that this is happening now is really exciting to me. And yeah, so uh, to answer your other question about, you know, me going to college campuses, I guess it was just last month I appeared virtually at this Hancock Symposium at Westminster College in Missouri uh, with the author Omar el who wrote the incredible climate novel American War, to talk about uh, his book and about climate fiction more generally and, you know, about why the genre continues to be important in larger conversations. I'm also going to have the great pleasure of speaking to a class at my alma mater, the University of Kansas, probably sometime next month. There's a professor who very kindly is using my newsletter in her class to oh, awesome. talk to students yeah, about, about art and literature and climate change. So there's a lot happening in that space as well. Very cool. Related to that note, we actually co-hosted an episode together where we interviewed a, a professor who focuses on these things, Matthew Snyder Meyerson. It was a very popular episode that was really fun. It was great having you on. I asked the sort of dumb questions, and you came in as the academic and you know really made it, a, made it a rich experience. But he was doing some kind of you know survey work on how climate literature influences behavior. Now, have you stayed in touch with Matthew? I have, I have. And Matthew's continuing to publish incredible studies about climate fiction. You know, he recently teamed up with some other researchers to put out a whole slate of new studies. I'm still working my way through them. But so far from what I read, it's really fascinating. So in one of the recent studies, more recent studies that he did, you know, he was looking at the kind of ideological impact of climate fiction on readers and, you know, and found that there are some stories that tend to kind of express a more individualism, even a conservatism, which is really interesting since in this country, at least, we tend to associate action on climate change with um, more liberal or progressive politics. And so, you know, he just kind of explored this this question of, you know, what is or how will climate fiction affect readers politically? And, you know, there, he very smartly says, you know, there's no one conclusion that we can draw from this. You know, rather, climate fiction continues to be a very wide, broad range of books kind of all lumped together under the same umbrella, but that it is worth thinking about you know, how else these books are influencing readers. It's not just their thinking on climate change, but it's their thinking on all the things that relate to taking action on climate change. You know, like, where do you fall on the spectrum politically? Where do you fall on the spectrum in terms of thinking that doing something about climate change is a personal issue or whether it should be a more social one? You know, can they influence you in terms of thinking about you know, whether you can take a personal action to do something about it or whether 
action can only be taken at the highest levels of government and, you know, at the very top of the corporate ladder. He is doing incredible work. I I can't wait to see what he does next. I I like to think I'm always one of his first readers. (laughs) And yeah, I'm just I'm very grateful for the work that he and his colleagues are doing. Very cool. All right. So I key and I think this is a very encouraging sign is that I, you know, just be a podcast and just nonfiction writing and articles and coverage of climate justice and climate equity. It's showing up a lot more. Do you yeah. feel like that's true within climate fiction? Mm, absolutely. I do. Absolutely. I do. To my mind, one of the best writers working today, Kim Stanley Robinson, who I think I probably mentioned on that first podcast I ever did with you. He has a new book that came out just this month called The Ministry for the Future. And like all of his work, it's set uh, in the near future. I think it opens in like 2024 or 2025, something like that, the very near future. And it opens with this devastating scene about a deadly heat wave that makes its way through India. Uh, I won't give too much away, but a lot of lives are lost and it radicalizes a doctor uh, or a scientist who, uh, an American scientist who is staying there and trying to do humanitarian work even before this heat wave hit. And what follows in this is this incredible depiction of how governments and other even more clandestine organizations, you know, had to work together or not to form a more just and sustainable future. And as Ken Stanley Robinson just makes it so clear, you know, in this, albeit work of fiction, but a very persuasive, you know, work of fiction, that the path to get from where we are now to this more utopian vision of tomorrow is going to be rife with a lot of injustice and a lot of terrible decisions made by some very important people, but that if we keep the idea of justice for everyone at the center of what we are doing. And, you know, we work towards a more collaborative, more equitable, more inclusive, you know, way of being that we will eventually reach this more utopian future where, you know, climate change has been mitigated, where um, climate justice has been acted on. And, you know, people everywhere have the right to live, you know, a healthy and safe life. That's a very long way of saying that, you know, climate justice is become, I think, at the forefront of these stories. And the Ministry for the Future is just an exemplary. It's just a a wonderful example of that. Well, that's very encouraging. All right. This might be one of those questions where you like, Doug, they can't answer this. But I was thinking about so much of climate change, especially with science and such as speculating on what's happening in the future, projecting what's going to happen in the future. A bit more is starting to happen now. We're living with the impacts today, wildfire and such. But are you familiar with any climate fiction that's actually set in the past? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. I am. You know, I a lot of really interesting novels have come out in the last couple of years that have been set in the last 20 years. There's one called The Gulf, which is set during W. Bush's presidency in Florida, where uh, a bunch of people are at, are at a writing retreat and are trying to survive a strengthened hurricane that is coming their way. So I think that's a great example. Ashley Shelby's South Pole Station, which is just a fantastic novel, is also set about 15 or 20 years ago at a science research station in Antarctica. And a oil company has hired a climate denialist to infiltrate that group and Mm -hmm. raises, you know, just all kinds of havoc for the people working there. And it's a novel that is much about policy and scientific fundraising as it is climate change, which I know doesn't sound like an interesting plot, but trust me, it is a wonderful novel. So yeah, you know, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them historical fiction, but definitely set, you know, in the last 20 years. And I, I love that because I think there's still this tendency for people to think that climate change is just happening or worse yet, that it hasn't even really happened yet. And, you know, we, we know that's not true, right? I mean, you, I, I know you know this. I know all the other people who come on your podcast know this, but I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, climate change is a century old and that the worst, or excuse me, that, you know, we have put more carbon 
you know, in the atmosphere in the last 30 years than, you know, all the previous years combined. And so it's just, it's amazing to me that, first of all, that more people don't know that. But second, that, you know, fiction writers have found a way to make that point such, a, you know, an interesting plot line in novels. Well, yeah, I think it would be interesting because you, the, you, as we're dealing with it now, there's you, we look back in key points of history, you're like, gosh, I wish we would have done it differently there. And my kind of <laughs> my desire is they make some sort of like Terminator type book, and it's like, all right, we're going to go back to the 1970s and attend those, you know, meetings of the oil companies, and it's going to be a Terminator like figure kind of <laughs> preventing them. <laughs> but uh, that that's my style of of fiction. But it seems like it's ripe, like so many key points, you know, and it would be kind of, and I'm sure. There's probably been actually a lot written on it, but just not necessarily aware of it. So, all right. In a recent Burning Worlds newsletter, you were highlighting some of these books, and you mentioned a little bit earlier of some over, um, international authors focusing on sort of what's what's happening in their countries. Maybe you could give us an example or two of that. I thought that was really fascinating on how they approach this issue. Yeah, absolutely. An author that I interviewed last month uh, named Angie Kampman. Uh, she's a German writer who published a novel called High as the Waters Rise. Uh, it was translated into English by Anne Poston. And it is an incredible novel about a, an, an oil rig worker who loses a dear friend and colleague while out uh, on the water and, you know, decides to take a a journey of self-exploration kind of around the world, you know, visits, you know, his hometown back in Germany and along the way, you know, meets everybody from family members of his uh, long gone friend to, you know, truck drivers who have actually carted the oil that, you know, his company has sucked from the ocean to just realize that, you know, this is climate change is a, planetary phenomenon that is caused by a global problem, you know, that it's it's people everywhere who are relying on fossil fuels, you know, that are contributing to to climate change and that, you know, that kind of combined with global consumerism and, you know, just this need for global connectiveness that is all contributing to climate change. And she tells this story, which is a global story at a very personal level, um, you know, through the eyes of a single man. And it's just a really beautiful book. And I'm not the only person that thinks that uh, it's actually a finalist for a national book award, wow. which will be announced, I think, in late November. Well, I will have a link to that column because I, you know, use some of the other examples there and certainly encourage my listeners to check out a lot of international authors don't necessarily get this coverage here. So I think that was great. You did that. Oh, great. All right. Here's another one of those questions where I'm not sure where I'm going with it, but I was thinking about climate change. If this is climate fiction, if there's a recurring character in most of these books, it's climate change, right? Because that's the whole point yeah. of climate fiction. And how that influences an author to come up, like, you know, there's all sorts of narrative devices when you're writing and, you know, you've got character development and such. But with climate change, there's always this, and of course some writers won't maybe acknowledge that humans are responsible, but you know, generally that will be the case. How does that influence people? And maybe you just don't know, but what I'm getting is just that as a key part of your narrative, it's, it's climate change and ultimately that was based on the behavior of human beings. And so that's this driver and all these, you could have a completely different kind of story. Do you see kind of where I'm, I'm getting at? It? And I'm just wondering yeah. if, does that, do you sense that my, that creates sideboards for authors and such? Because it's, it's almost like it's the notion of like the sins of my father, right? That's sort of like, we're dealing with this climate change. It's not like a hurricane that just randomly happens. No matter what, it was humans who created this issue and Every kind of book, it's like that's sort of sitting back there. Yeah. No, I'm really glad that you brought this up because, you know, climate change is, is very hard to write about, I think, in fiction and in nonfiction, because it's such a large, thorny, wicked problem. In fiction especially, it's hard to write about because if climate change is the villain, you know, how do you personify that? Right. Because when we think about, you know, heroes versus bad guys in fictional stories, it usually comes down to a gunfight or, you know, for your superhero, some, you know, 
big elaborate blowout in the middle of a metropolis somewhere. But, you know, you can't stop climate change with a gun or a sword or even a magic wand. So it it's an increasingly, I think, difficult thing for even fiction writers to tackle. That said, there have been a lot of different approaches to writing about this. I think one of the most effective approach that fiction writers have taken is the intergenerational story. You know, the one where, you know, we see, as you said, the father and like in my father's, you know, problem you know, first experiencing climate change, but then seeing how two, three, five generations later, people are still wrestling with climate change, adapting to it or not, uh, mitigating it or not. And those types of stories really help the reader to see how, you know, climate change, it's not are we going to stop it or are we not? Like, it's not its not a dualistic proposition. I mean, I think any scientist will tell you that short of some you know, spectacular geoengineering. I mean, climate change is, is going to continue, but how bad are we going to let it get? And these generational stories, I think, really can help the reader to either vision, envision a future wherein we have done something about it, like in the work of Ken Stanley Robinson, or a future, you know, where we haven't done too much about it, like in the work of, say, James Bradley's Clay, which is another gorgeous story, but, you know, one in which you know, the, the, the future is not nearly as optimistic. And what those stories also allow for, and I think this gets to your point about climate change being related to human activity, is that, you know, they both of those novels and so many like them make it clear that climate change is a result from humanity's reliance on the fossil fuels and that there is an irrationality <laughs> to our continued use of them because we are destroying, you know, the the planet that we love. So, you know, the fictional representations of climate change absolutely drive that point home, at least when it's done really well, while also showing us what a future could look like if we decide to do something about, you know, our reliance on those those fuels. All right. Well, that was a great answer. And it, it just it occurred to me that there's all sorts of books and you could have black and white sort of books. You know, there's good guys and bad guys, but even that, if the climate change is the issue, it's the humans ultimately that they are this vague bad guy that's driving a lot of what your book, even if you are trying to make it simplistic. Now, if you're doing a black comedy or something like that, then gee, it lends itself to that really nicely. But it's just this character and humans are so attached to it. How does that influence the tone and all that? I just, yeah, I mean, you, you sort of explained that, but I just, I find that very interesting. And I'll just be curious as, as things kind of get a bit more sketchier, how that makes climate fiction evolve. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it will evolve. You know, as I was saying earlier, you know, people who are writing about climate change in their work, they are responding to the world in which we live. All great literature has always done that, not just literature about climate change, but, you know, any literature that has ever been really meaningful for people. You know, it's about the world we live in. And as climate change evolves, so will the stories about it. I think adaptation, you sort of talked about that, is going to lend itself maybe to some, some more positive storytelling. We need some, is it the Jack Reacher or like a born identity <laughs> where you have this super cool adaptation professional that just builds seawalls all over the place, but there's a lot of adventure and romance. And, you know, that that adaptation, I think, lends itself to a very positive narrative for, <laughs> so, so I think, right? Uh, sure. For sure. Right. Don't patronize me. Um <laughs> This happens to you a lot more than it does me, but it still happens a lot is I get books sent to me. I get ebooks sent to me and I, I want to give some advice to people out there that are writing books. So if someone's interested in publishing their own climate book, what, what sort of advice would you give them? And not everyone's going to get published with a big publisher, but it's still, you know, everyone, if they have a book that they want to write, I would encourage them to write it, even if no one ultimately reads it. But do you have that conversation quite a bit? People reaching out to you and saying, hey, I've got this book. Yeah, I mean, I do hear from a lot of people. And I always struggle a bit with what to tell them, because at the end of the day, while I am a writer, I'm not a novelist, though I read a heck of a lot of them. <laughs> but, you know, I will say that, you know, of the novels that I've seen getting published, uh, and I've seen a lot of novels get published on the subject of climate change, you know, no two are exactly alike. You know, they all have a unique take on it that's still for 
for whatever reasons, you know, those books still feel like they're rooted in the real world. And I think that's kind of the magical balance. It's finding a unique and captivating story that you know only you can tell, that nobody else can tell as well as you, that still feels like it's a part of the real world and that other people can relate to. You know, how you go about doing that, I mean, I think that's one of the oldest writerly questions of all time. But I think that's the ultimate goal is you know, write the unique story that others can relate to that still feels like it's a part of this world, even if it's set, I know, 200 years from now. Okay, I, I have to know this. How fast do you read through a book? I mean, you have to read so many books. How fast do you do that? <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, the, the fact that, you know, I spent many, many years in graduate school and, um, you know, had to read just hundreds of books, you know, to get through my coursework and then ultimately to write my dissertation, I got a lot of practice in reading and synthesizing information really quickly. So, you know, I usually read, you know, anywhere from two to four books a week. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I I just don't find the time to read. I read like when I go to bed at night. And so that lasts five, 10 minutes and I conk out. And so it takes me six weeks to read a book. And uh, is you this probably happens to you but I, I you'll get the, the like publisher people reaching out saying hey would you like this book and i try to be honest with them i'm like there's just a good chance i'm not going to get through this book if at all, sure. at all. but they send it anyway cuz you know it, it, there's always a chance for some exposure but like you're you're a good one to send it to us <laughs> two to four a week <laughs> Wow. Well, thanks. Well, you know, I, it's, I'm really actually glad that you brought that up. Not that I'm a fast reader, but that so many smart people in this space like yourself just don't have time to read. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it kind of touches on your point earlier about how, you know, there's this need for more movies and TV shows about climate change. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of people, especially right now, who are, you know, whose worlds have been turned upside down because of the pandemic, they have less time than ever before. And so picking up a book, it just isn't an option for them. But they may have 30 minutes to an hour to sit down with a TV show. And I don't know if I want to say relax with it, because climate change isn't necessarily a relaxing theme. But I do think that there is something slightly more passive to watching TV than picking up a book and taking it in. If that's not true, then I don't understand why even people like me get so tired <laughs> while reading books because it is work. You know, I, I think the fact that there's going to be more movies and TV shows is only going to be a boon for the climate conversations because at the end of the day, more people are going to take in those types of climate narratives than they are from a book, as much as it pains me to say it. <laughs> that's that, true. I, I hope that's what happens. Currently, I'm reading The Shining. This shows you what kind of stuff that I'm reading. I'm just reading it's an old, you know, ancient book. That's but a sure. fantastic book, and it's a great movie. Right, right, right. And I, I give that a try, and so someone's like, here's a climate book. I'm wait a sec. I do that for a living. I don't want to do that when I'm lying in bed and <laughs> reading. Amy, we're almost done here. What's next for you? What What's on your plate? Oh, well, thanks for asking. I have this uh, anthology to tie up and to get sent to the editor so we can eventually see it on shelves. You know, I am also continuing uh, to publish my newsletter and column at the Chicago Review of Books. And just a couple of months ago, I launched a new column over at Literary Hub where every month I recommend approximately five books that have come out on climate change that I think readers can get a lot from. And it's always a mix of fiction and nonfiction. Sometimes there's some poetry thrown in there, but the they're all about climate change and they're all really great books in and of their own right. Awesome. And you and I actually got recruited. We're going to co-moderate a panel of uh, the Sustainable Production Forum just in actually yeah. in, a, in a few days. That should be fun. It's the, the inter, this entertainment industry group that works on sustainability issues. They're doing a panel. I think there are going to be some actors, some writers, and they, they wanted some folks that are knee deep in the space to kind of help moderate it. So, yeah, looking forward to that with you. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. You know, every time I come on your show, I have such a great time talking with you. And I think having the chance to speak with you and these other experts from, you know, all different areas of entertainment, I think it's going to be a great conversation. 
It, it will be. We, you, you and I, maybe we need to touch base in the next few days just sort of say, you know, uh, it'll be a new kind of panel for me. It's like, well, there's an actor doing this kind of stuff. I got to really kind of think about what we're going to ask them. So, OK, on that note, this is the end of the episode. And I ask this of all my guests. What guest would you recommend? Come on, America Daps. Oh, my goodness. Let me think. Have I ever recommended to you the author Omar el I don't think so. All right. I just so I just appeared with him at the Hancock Symposium last month at Westminster College. I think I mentioned that earlier. And, you know, at risk of kind of, I don't know, always over recommending him. You know, he is just such a smart, thoughtful thinker. And his novel American War, I think, is a must read for anybody who's interested in novels and climate change. And he also has a background in journalism. And so he understands kind of at a base level the importance of storytelling and is as good a speaker as he is a writer. So I think your uh, listeners would really get a lot out of a conversation with him. Cool. Great suggestion. OK, and, and I can't leave it without asking, are we any closer to getting an Amy Brady podcast? <laughs> well, thank you so much for asking. And you were actually so helpful in giving me some basics. I think we might be a little bit closer. Okay. I had to I had to put it slightly on the back burner for um, for book related reasons. But I'm hoping to think about it in more depth here um, in the next few weeks. And listen, my advice, too, is like you're interacting with these professors and all these different people. There's students out there that need to handle all the tech issues. I know you have some issues there. Just let them take over in that respect. And so there's ways of kind of avoiding the the worst pain in the butt parts of doing a podcast. So, Well, that would be great. I can I can bring the talking and the expertise, but if somebody else wants to take the production part over, that would be wonderful. Awesome. Amy. Always a treat talking with you. And of course, I'll have you on in the future. And there's, it sounds like with your book, that maybe even before that. But thanks for what you're doing and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Doug. I'd love to come on your show. Hey, adapters. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Amy. I certainly did. I especially appreciated how climate fiction might resonate more with the general public. We need every tool in the arsenal getting people to recognize the gravity of the situation. For some, climate change is just too complex or large a subject to wrap their heads around. If climate fiction can help make the issue more approachable and understandable, then I hope we see a lot more of it. Reach out on social media to me and to Amy if you have a favorite climate fiction novel. I would love to hear what you guys have been reading. Okay, before we get to the final wrap-up, I wanted to share a promo for another podcast. I don't do these often, but I thought you might find this interesting. Constipation, diarrhea, bloating, gas, irritable bowel syndrome. Are you struggling to restore your gut to perfect health? On the Perfect Stool podcast, you'll hear functional and naturopathic medicine professionals, patients, and scientists talk about the gut microbiome, the current state of research, and how you can apply it to your life. Learn about the gut microbiome's influence not just on digestive health, but on cardiovascular health, mental health, autoimmune disease, skin conditions, and overweight and obesity. Check out The Perfect Stool, understanding and healing the gut microbiome on your favorite app today. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. So for those who are wondering, yes, Lindsay Parsons is related to me. She's my wife. She's been hassling me for a while to share a promo of her podcast on my show. So if it seems a bit off topic, well, that's the reason. That said, it is a great informative podcast. For those who are interested in gut health, you're not going to find a better pod on the subject. Definitely check it out. Links in my show notes. And yes, we're a family of podcasters. Okay, don't forget to check out the Podcast in the Classroom initiative we're doing. We've developed some discussion guides for specific episodes using your class with your students. Also, with a huge transition to online learning due to COVID-19, consider using podcasts. Or students, ask your teachers to use podcasts. You can find the discussion guides on my website at americadaps.org. Okay, so if you're interested in highlighting your adaptation work in a podcast via America Daps, and yes, this is different than Simpatico, think about using a podcast. I've worked with a bunch of partners, World Wildlife Fund, MIT, the trustees of Massachusetts, lots of different groups doing lots of cool work. So maybe you want to tell your story via podcast. Reach out. Let's partner. Also, I do presentations to classes and keynote presentations at conferences, and I know we're all taking a break from those, but feel free to contact me if you are interested in having me speak at your event. So most of you have heard me talk about the work that I'm doing with Simpatico Studios. I'm hosting live talk shows on the Climate Adaptation channel. So this is a streaming TV channel dedicated to climate adaptation. 
I have just passed the 150 interview mark on Simpatico. I'm interviewing climate adaptation experts, clean energy entrepreneurs, and academics from around the world. So it's a little bit more broad in scope than what I do with the podcast. Now, if you're a professional in this space, maybe we can have a conversation about the important work that you're doing. And if we're also encouraging you to just come check things out, come watch a live show and join the community room. Browsers behind a firewall. So reach out to me or go to simpatico.com. And that's with a C, C C-I-M-P-A-T-I-C-O. And put your information in and we'll get directions to you on how you can sign up. And yes, it's all free. We just want you to check things out. Okay, some final housekeeping. Join the Facebook page in the Facebook community group. The group is private, but search for America Daps. And I'll prove you right away. It's a chance to hear insider info on the podcast and see what other listeners are sharing on their wall. Some great conversations come up in that group. And on that note, please email me. Let me know who you are and what you're doing. Your favorite episodes, guests that you might want to recommend. I hear from people from all over the world and I love hearing because it allows me to, to understand what you guys are doing and where you guys are at and how you get value out of the podcast. So please consider taking a few minutes and emailing me at americadaps at gmail.com. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.